So um, I'll just talk a little bit. I don't have Martin Cron uh, Cronin with me. Uh, Martin Cronin has retired, and I do it with a, an actor called Martin Cronin, who is fantastic at doing the readings. But um, I'm indebted to the previous speakers who've sort of put, put the context of what was happening in the 1920s, 1930s. Atomic physics, of course, was, was, was very popular. It was uh, almost like the, the population was waiting for the next big breakthrough. And uh, so it was in the popular press. Now, the thing about Flann O'Brien is that he wasn't a scientist at all. He was born in Sturban in 1911, and he was a Gaelic scholar. He was brought up speaking Irish as his first language, and he had very little scientific background. His brother, Michal, who I've, I've got to know, told me that the only science, formal science he did was his, his leaving cert equivalent, as it was then, at school, secondary level school. But yet science permeates... Uh, probably his most famous book, which is The Third Policeman. And a lot of it is clearly influenced by, by atomic physics. Um, so when he was, when he was uh, at UCD in the 1930s, he was writing uh, his thesis in Gaelic. It was about the Irish language. All this stuff was going on, and it, as we've heard, it was in the press. It was the popular press were picking it up and it was being published. And somehow, all this, these breakthroughs got into his head somehow, and he then wove that into his writing. Um, so The Third Policeman was published in 1966, but it was written in 1939, round about then, 1938-39. Uh, Brian O'Nolan is his, his real name, but he wrote under a pseudonym, uh, Flan O'Brien, because he had a job as a civil servant and he wanted to keep it, keep it quiet what he was doing. He also wrote his Miles Nicopoli in the Irish Times. And um, his first book, It's When Two Birds, was published in 1939. He sold 200 roughly copies, and then the warehouse storing the books was blown up in the Blitz in London, so it was wiped out. The second book, The Third Policeman, was rejected. And he hid it in his attic and told people that he lost it. So it was only published uh, after he died. But the writing is actually from the late 1930s and influenced by all this, this physics. Um, and there's a few things that, that come together. Flann O'Brien or Brian O'Nolan, we often ask ourselves, myself and Martin, where, where did all this science come from? He's, he's transfixed also with Schrodinger. Schrodinger, uh, he wrote about in the Irish Times, and de Valera, who he appeared to despise, uh, and any sort of pre pretentiousness. Now, de Valera convinced Schrodinger to come to Dublin in December 1939, which was a, a great achievement for Ireland to bring a world-class physicist to Ireland at that time. Now, if you want, the way I rationalise it is that de Valera was absolutely transfixed by the, 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 the concept that Ireland would be a respectable nation among the nations of the world. And at that time, it was very clear that you could not be a respectable nation at the top of the nations unless you had a world-class Nobel laureate atomic physicist <laughs> and an appropriate institute for that physicist to actually work in, which didn't exist. So he had to create an institute which became the Dublin Institute for Advanced Studies, DI, DIAS, uh, which was a cu curious creation because it only has two schools, uh, theoretical physics and Celtic studies. <laughs> and that's how it still is set up. Now, uh, this gives you sort of an insight into how de Valera thought. I don't know why this happened. Maybe he put up the Celtic studies to, to sort of smokescreen the fact that he had created a school, an actual institute around a Nobel laureate to get the Nobel laureate to come from Austria to, to Ireland. But there's, there's a few readings. I don't want to take too much time uh, up. It's well known that in The Third Policeman, he writes about atomic theory, where he talks about people turning into bicycles because the, the policemen and, and people in the west of Ireland spend a lot of time on bicycles. And atoms, which are the ultimate essence of all, all uh, matter, would exchange between the bicycles and the people, and the people, peopleness would go into the bicycles, and bi bicycleness would go into the people. So people gradually become bicycles, and, and bicycles gradually become people. The thing, the thing about his writing is that he uses a lot of science, but he is always right in, in, the, in the basic fundamentals of what he writes about. 
For example, the mad scientist De Selby talks about the link between time and, and light. And we all know that if you look at the sun, you don't see the sun as it is. You see the sun as it was. 78 minutes, seven and a half minutes previously, it takes seven and a half minutes for the light to come to your eyes. So you actually see the sun as it was. And that's why if you look further and further into space, you see further and further back in time. And in uh, De Selby's passage, he sets up an infinite series of parallel mirrors, gets a huge telescope, and looks at the smallest mirror that he can find in the, in the infinite series, and he sees, looking back at him, the beardless face of a boy of about 14, of singular beauty himself, of course. But what's less well known is, is uh, the scene in chapter 2 where he describes something momentous happening to the hero. And I personally think that this is, is um, drawn from Schrodinger's famous uh, thought experiment, uh, Schrodinger's cat. You know this experiment where there's a box and there's an electron and two partitions? Well, there's a piece of there's, a, there's an alpha, is it an alpha emitter? No, it's a beta emitter, so it's electrons. And if the, this box is left in, in, uh, in position, and it automatically opens after time t, where the probability that there's an electron in the box is 50%. So when the lid of the box opens up, there's 50% chance there's an electron, and 50% chance there isn't an electron. If there is an electron, it comes out and it's detected by this diabolical machine, as Schrodinger described it, which had a an electron detector. If it detected the electron, it released poisonous gas, which kills a cat that happens to be sitting minding its own business in the room. Uh, if there's no electron, that cascade of events doesn't happen, and the cat continues to wander around the room unaffected. So this was, this was Schrodinger's thought experiment. a famous experiment published in 1935. So there's a box, and that box holds the secret to life or death depending on what happens. And there's a scene in chapter two in, in, in the third policeman, which I don't think people have properly analyzed, and we've had a lot of discussions about this. So in the third policeman, in chapter one, the hero who's unnamed and, and his, his buddy called Divney, they, they batter an old man called Mathers to death with a spade because they want to steal his box, which is in his bedroom. Right? And Divney convinces the hero after they kill this guy to go up to the bedroom and get the box because it's full of money. So the hero goes up, and I, th I think it's some of the finest writing from Flannel Brown, because usually he writes really, he can write really good stuff, and then he, can't sust he just can't sustain it. He always puts a joke in at the end, but in, in, in this one he doesn't, and I think it's lovely. So here's, here's this reading. This is, this is the hero going into the room. I made my way quickly to the hall, threw open the door of the room where the box was, and paused on the threshold. It was a dark morning and the weather had stained the windows of layers of grey ash which kept the brightest part of the weak light from coming in. The far corner of the room was a blur of shadow. I had a sudden urge to have done with my task and be out of this house forever. I walked across the bare boards, knelt in the corner and passed my hands about the floor in search of the loose board. To my surprise I found it easily and it rocked hollowly under my hand. I lifted it up, laid it aside, and struck a match. I saw the black metal cash box na uh, nestling dimly in the hole. I put my hand down and crooked a finger into the loose reclining handle, but the match suddenly flickered and went out. And the hand of the box, which I had lifted up about an inch, slid heavily off my finger. Without stopping to light another match, I thrust my hand bodily into the opening, and just as it should be closing on the box, something happened. I cannot hope to describe what it was, but it had frightened me very much long before I had understood it even slightly. It was some change which came upon me or upon the room, indescribably subtle, yet momentous, ineffable. It was as if the daylight had changed with unnatural suddenness, as if the temperature of the evening had alt altered greatly in the instant, or as if the air had become twice as dense as it had, as it had been in the twinkling of an eye. It's wonderful. And that is the death of the hero. He's describing the death of the hero because Devney had booby-trapped the box. So I think the, the correlations with, with uh, Schrodinger's thought experiment are really strong. But nobody seems to have picked this up. And 
You know, I'll just finish off then. Um, there's a couple of other great quotes I can give. Very quick ones. So, Miles and the Gopling, as he was writing in, in the Irish Times, had a go at, when Schrodinger set up Dias, there's some really funny things. He tried to establish it and quickly get some other people to join him. So he tried to get Paul Dirac to come from Cambridge. And Cambridge in 1942, he was, of course, the co-recipient of the Nobel Prize with Schrodinger in 1933. And Cambridge was being bombed by the Germans. And uh, um, um, Dirac and his wife Nancy just had a new daughter. So they were, they were vulnerable. And Schrodinger writes, not to Dirac, but to, to uh, Nancy, to the wife. Because he knows if he convinces the wife to move, the husband will come. So it's not the husband you write to. And it's re really good to put it in the context of what we do these days if you're trying to entice some big scientist to come to your country. We talk about institutes and laboratories and equipment and big salary packages. <laughs> and this is what Dirac said to Nancy. <laughs> That was the priority in 1942. Uh, so he did have a goal. He had a goal at uh, Schrodinger and in, indirectly through him, the Dublin Institute for Advanced Studies, uh, during the inaugural lectures by the two incumbent professors. So this was Schrodinger, who, who was giving a lecture on the first cause about the universe and the origins of the universe, and did there have to be a first cause? In other words, does it have to be a god? And uh, O'Rahilly's big area of research was about St. Patrick in, in the Irish annals. And if you track it through, uh, St. Patrick is referred to over a period of about 200 years. So O'Rahilly's thesis was that there's definitely more than one person who became known as St. Patrick. So here's, here's a wonderful little piece of text that he wrote in the Irish Times, which led to a court case where he was almost sacked and the Times were fined 100 pounds, and the counsel for, um, for, for Dias insisted that he never refer to the Institute again in his writings, which of course he ignored. But here it is, and this is, this is, this is very relevant even today. As an academic, there's some things he says here that really hit home in a short piece of text. Talking of this notorious Institute, Lord, what I would give for a chair in it with me, 1,000 good-looking pounds a year for doing work that most people regard as an interesting recreation. <laughs> Talking of it anyway, a friend has drawn my attention to Professor O'Reilly's recent address on Palladius and Patrick. In other words, two St. Patrick's. I understand also that Professor Schrodinger has been proven lately he can't establish a first cause. So the first fruits of this institute, therefore, has been an effort to show that there are two St. Patrick's and no God. <laughs> And I'll just finish off with the last one is, is, is where he writes, this is typical, a short piece of text, but it hits home, it hits so hard, so many targets. It can be seen as a little joke, but it's also subversive. If you think about that last piece of text, he was attacking de Valera's entire policy to get a, a physicist to come to Ireland and establish himself. So here, uh, the first big colloquium was held in, in Dias in 1942, July 1942. And, of course, it was on uh, atomic theory, atomic physics. And his piece, this little piece, was inspired by a remark by the English astrophysicist Arthur Stanley Eddington at the colloquium that less than 100 people in the world can discuss relativity theory intelligently. So his response, now you have to understand that he was raised in the Irish language. He loved the Irish language, as, but he absolutely hated the whole... Um, aristocracy and, and administration and government policies around the Irish language which continue to fail us even to today. So he proposed that, and this is linked to, to schooling and how Irish is taught at schools and any, even the young people here today, if you've been taught Irish at schools, I'm sure you feel, that you, feel you, you resonate with what he says here. Relativity theory should be immediately introduced into Irish schools and taught in the Irish language. <laughs> Then instead of being illiterate in two languages, our children can be illiterate in four dimensions. <laughs> Thanks, Brian, for the invitation.